I'd also like to thank the European Society of uh, Cardiology, uh, which has uh, provided me with this uh, European Society First Contact Initiative Grant, uh, which has allowed me to uh, take this uh, opportunity to come out to Italy. And of course, uh, the College of Pharmacy, Qatar University, for uh, giving me this spare time to uh, go out and uh, explore other research avenues. And definitely, this wouldn't have been possible again if it wasn't for Professor Morrow and his willingness to open his lab to me. So uh, thank you very much. So before I really start my talk, I thought I would break the ice by just telling you a little bit about Doha, Qatar. Maybe it's a little unfamiliar. So I have traveled uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of where I started. I'm originally Lebanese, but I was born and raised in Canada. So I really spent little time in Lebanon, but I'm sure the geography of Lebanon is quite similar to Italy. I'm actually born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is the west coast of Canada. Very cold. Our winters are usually minus 40. And uh, our winters usually last about uh, eight months. So minus 40, I say, is probably the extreme. Now, the funny thing is I actually moved to Doha, Qatar, three and a half years ago, where the temperature is about plus 40. So I went from a snowman to a sandman. So if anybody doesn't know, Qatar is a West, uh, Western Asia part of the world. It actually is on the south part of Saudi Arabia. It's basically the only inland area that surrounds Qatar. The rest is surrounded by the peninsula or the, uh, the uh, Gulf uh, uh, waters. So Qatar is a very new city. Uh, you know, when I talk to friends who were there only about five or six years ago, they tell me that Qatar is completely changed and reformed. So it's, uh, it's an evolving uh, new uh, city, and uh, it's, it's quite, quite nice. Everything is still relatively new, but with relatively new stuff means that there's also uh, a lot of uh, protocols that are actually being identified. So I have been fortunate to be a part of some of this change. So I come from the College of Pharmacy, Qatar University. Qatar University is a government-owned uh, university. It's not the only university in the country. They've also got some American and Canadian-based uh, university, University of Calgary, which offers nursing, uh, while Cornell, which offers a medical program, Qatar University, which offers the College of Pharmacy. Now, although College of Pharmacy is situated in Qatar University, most interesting thing is that it has full Canadian accreditation for their program. It's got six years of that. It's the only College of Pharmacy outside of Canada that has full accreditation. And what that really means is that our students are going through the same curriculum as Canadian students. In addition, they're writing the Canadian pharmacy exam at the end of the program. Uh, uh, although our students are graduating with the same credentials, we hope, of Canadian students, Qatar really doesn't want to be losing their students and would prefer that they stay in-house in and help uh, expand the pharmacy uh, industry in Qatar. College of Pharmacy has a BSc program. It's a uh, pre-pharmacy with four years of uh, pharmacy. We've also got a PharmD, which is a postgraduate one-year uh, clinical rotation uh, following a BSc. And in the last uh, three years, we've had the Master's in Pharmaceutical Sciences. As of September, we've opened our Master's program to both a clinical pharmacy as well as a pharmaceutical sciences. And we've just put in a recent proposal for a PhD program, although we're not really sure if that's going to be initiated in 2015 or 2016. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just wanted to kind of give you a heads up as to where I'm coming from. You know, currently our vision, mission, and goal at the College of Pharmacy is really to be the leading pharmacy school. So our research program has just really started to evolve in the last uh, uh, probably two, three years. So research, um, and particularly some of our in infrastructure, is still quite relatively new. Even within Qatar, the uh, research concepts, it's actually moving quickly, but again, still something that's quite new. They have a Qatar Cardiovascular Research Institute, which has opened in the last year, Qatar Biomedical uh, uh, Research Institute, which is diabetes and oncology, and they have ADLQ, which is an anti-doping lab, in preparation for what we hope is a proposed FIFA 2022. So just to follow up with some of our vision, mission, and goals, we're hoping that we prepare our students to provide optimal pharmaceutical care 
and advance healthcare outcomes to promote research and scholarly activity. And basically the college is following a 2013 to 2016 strategic plan, which is trying to address some of these vision, vision missions and goal. So if you are interested in the College of Pharmacy or any of our researchers or personnel, please feel free to visit our, our website, Qatar University College of Pharmacy. And uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite uh, up to date, I would say. So I guess jumping into some of the more interesting things and uh, my, the reason I'm here today, which is basically uh, my interest in cardiac remodeling, which I know some of you have, uh, are working on or are interested in. And I hope that my intro here is not too basic, but I think it's one that's really important that we all remember. So as we know, the heart is a very complex organ. It beats about 80 million times in 80 years, obviously making it very susceptible to any sorts of injuries. So we know that cardiac remodeling is something that actually occurs after prolonged pressure and is a great concern. Uh, with uh, WHO estimating that there's going to be about 23.6 million people dying of cardiovascular diseases in the world. Now this is particularly relevant not only in this region but also in the Middle East where we have a high level of obesity, high level of diabetes. Not only is it a concern in the Middle East, we know it's also quite concerning even in North America. So what are some of the causes of cardiac hypertrophy? We know cardiac hypertrophy could be both an adaptive as well as a a, a, a pathological disease. So it could actually be a physiological compensatory mechanism in response to pregnancy or people who are actually uh, doing excessive amounts of, of, uh, of running, swimming. But we also know that cardiac hypertrophy could be pathological, and this is really the one that we're most concerned with. Some of the pathological causes of cardiac hypertrophy include pressure and volume overload, cases such as hypertension, mitral valve regurgitation, as well as post-myocardial infarctions. So cardiac hypertrophy could actually be uh, uh, classified or recognized um, both at a cellular level as well as on a whole organ level. And when we look at cardiac hypertrophy on a cellular level, we know that there are certain parameters that are looked at, which include cell surface area, protein content, protein synthesis, as well as induction of fetal genes, including the atrial natriuretic peptide, all of which are upregulated during conditions of cardiac hypertrophy. On a, on a whole uh, heart level, we know that it, it's actually uh, classified and organized by systolic dysfunction, which is characterized by decrease in ejection fraction, fractional shortening, and uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction, collagen deposition, inflammation, and fibrosis. And I bring these to your attention because, as you know, these are some of the parameters that we look at when we're trying to characterize some of our models for cardiac hypertrophy. So we know that cardiac hypertrophy, although it could be a physiological response in terms of pregnancy and, and, and uh, uh, athletes, we know that when it becomes pathological, it actually could predispose the heart to failure. And therefore, it's really important for us to understand pathological cardiac hypertrophy in order to help actually prevent the development and progression of heart failure. So from the title, you saw that I'm going to be talking today about the osteopointin sodium proton exchanger, both of which have become my babies and favorite uh, proteins uh, of, or my proteins of interest. So the sodium proton exchanger is quite an interesting one. It's a membrane protein. It actually consists of 10 isoforms. The isoform that we're most concerned with is the sodium proton exchanger isoform 1. It's a ubiquitously expressed sodium proton exchanger, but the sodium proton exchanger isoform 1 seems to be the one that is exclusive to the heart. The sodium proton exchanger has a very unique function, and basically what, is it, what it does is it removes intracellular protons in exchange for sodium. And by doing this, it actually helps maintain the intracellular pH. In fact, it's believed that the sodium proton exchanger contributes to almost 50% of pH regulation. In addition to its ability to regulate intercellular pH, the sodium proton exchanger is involved in cell volume, cell differentiation, cell survival, and in fact, it's actually even been shown to be involved in maintaining and growth of uh, stem cells, just quite recent uh, in vitro data. 
the sodium proton exchanger is actually activated upon acidic stimulation. That's one of the most common ways of activation. Usually under normal conditions, it's basally expressed. In addition to activation by the sodium, uh, in addition to its activation by protons, it's actually thought to be activated by numerous kinases. And what's been discovered about the sodium proton exchanger is that it's got a C-terminal domain. The C-terminal domain has a number of uh, phosphorylation sites which actually make it easy for these kinases to act on. Some of the kinases that have been shown to regulate the activity of the sodium proton exchanger include AKT, some of the uh, mitogen activated protein kinases including ERK, as well as P90 ribosomal S6 kinase, which I'll talk a little bit more about in my upcoming slides. Other proteins which are thought to actually cause activation of the sodium proton exchanger include the CAM kinase, as well as calmodulin binding site. Now the calmodulin binding site is a very interesting site on the sodium proton exchanger. In fact, it produces auto inhibition of the sodium proton exchanger. Now this becomes really relevant once I talk to you a little bit about our transgenic mice. We actually inhibited or we mutated the calmodulin binding sites so that we could render the sodium proton exchanger active. In addition, we know that carbonic anhydrase is also thought to activate the sodium proton exchanger. So as you could see here, in summary, the sodium proton exchanger has two domains. The N-terminal, which is involved in removing protons in exchange for sodium, as well as the C-terminal, which is involved in regulation through different types of kinases. So basically we know that the sodium proton exchanger has been involved in numerous uh, physiological functions, including cell volume, uh, survival, uh, as well as uh, apoptosis, migration. In the heart, the sodium proton exchanger has a very unique role. It's believed that the sodium uh, proton exchanger has been shown to be upregulated both mRNA, protein expression, activity in conditions of different types of heart failure in vivo, in vitro models. In addition, it's been shown that inhibition of the sodium proton exchanger has a protective effect. So basically, an increase in the sodium proton exchanger has been proposed to cause progression of cardiac hypertrophy. The one issue is that nobody actually really showed uh, whether there is a direct cause in terms of the sodium proton exchanger. There was never ever a gain of function model. And that was what we went on to do is we developed a gain of function model both in vivo and in vitro to really characterize the role of the sodium proton exchanger. Now it was also unknown whether the sodium proton exchanger in terms of protein or its activity was contributing to these changes in hypertrophy. And so what we went on to do is we created both an in vitro model as well as an in vivo model to characterize a sodium proton exchanger in the setting of cardiac hypertrophy. For our in vitro model, we used the primary culture of neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes. And we used the adenovirus. I know you're all a big fan of the adeno associated, but we use this in vitro and only as a tool to characterize our model. So yeah, so we, we actually had uh, three different uh, uh, viruses. We had the GFP, the green fluorescent protein, which we used as a control. We used a wild type form of NHE1, which was basically just the protein expression. And we used an active form of NHE1, where we increased the activity of the sodium proton exchanger. And one of the ways we created this active form of NHE1 was by mutating the calmodulin binding site. So I've just kind of abbreviated the control as GFP, the wild type NHE1 as IRM, and the active NHE1 as KIRM. And I'll remind you of these when I actually show you some of the data. In terms of our in vivo model, we actually had three. We had our FEB control, our N line, which basically mimics the IRM in culture, was expressing wild type NHE1, and our K line, which was expressing active NHE1. So I just kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about our active NHE1 adenovirus. And it was basically the same plasmid that was used to create our in vivo model. So as I told you, the sodium proton exchanger has an N-terminal, C-terminal. is a C-terminal that's involved in regulating the sodium proton exchanger with that calmodulin binding site. 
And so what we did is we made a few mutations. In fact, we mutated lysine 641, 643, and 645, 647 to glutamic acid. And we actually had done numerous studies to show that by, these, by making these mutations, you're able to uh, render and inhibit the activity of calmodulin and make the sodium proton exchanger active. And I just wanted to point out that our plasma did contain an HA tag and a green fluorescent protein, which allowed us to monitor uh, whether it was the adenovirus or a protein of expression. So when we actually first started to characterize our uh, neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, which were infected with GFP, the IRM or the KIRM, first thing we did is just made sure that the protein was being expressed. We looked at NHE1 protein expression in our GFP group, in our IRM group, as well as in our KIRM group, and we could see that there's an increase in the NHE1 expression. We went on to simply characterize for some simple parameters, including cell area as well as protein content. So when we looked at our neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, which were infected with our active NHE1 or just our wild type NHE1, what was really interesting is we only saw cardiac cardiomyocyte hypertrophy when we looked at cell surface area in our neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, which were infected with the active form of NHE1. Now when we used EMD, which was an NHE1 inhibitor, we were able to regress this hypertrophic effect. Now when we looked at neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, which just expressed the wild type form of NHE1, we didn't really see any changes in the presence or absence of an NHE1 inhibitor. And we saw similar results when we looked at protein content to see, or protein synthesis, to see whether there was changes in protein synthesis when we infected the neonatal rat ventricular myocytes with active NHE1. So then we went on to actually look at some of our, just showing you snapshots of some of the data. We went on to characterize some of our in vivo transgenic mice. And again, we have the three models, the N line, which expresses just wild type protein expression, and the K line, which expresses the active form of NHE1. So with our NHE1 transgenic mice, we did have the alpha mice and heavy chain promoter to direct the sodium proton exchanger to the heart. We also had an HA tag, which allowed us to monitor protein expression. And again, just showing you snapshots of some of our data. So when we actually looked at some of our cross sections, simply taking our hearts and looking at the morphology, we could see that with our K-line mice, we see an enlarged heart. And again, we don't even have to really know much about the heart. Simply viewing it, we could see that there's some changes that are going on. We actually took some cross sections of the heart, and again, we could see that with our cross sections, our K line mice show dilatation of some sort. We went on to measure a few parameters, including heart weight to body weight ratio, cross sectional area, as well as interstitial fibrosis. And again, we see the same trend that we saw previously that it's with the active form of NHE1, which here is abbreviated by the K-line, that we see greater increases in heart weight to body weight in the cross-sectional area, in the atrial natriuretic peptide level, as well as in measurements of interstitial fibrosis. So basically with our N-line mice, we do see slight changes in the heart weight to body weight ratio, but we really saw no changes when it came down to our histology. So we could actually uh, summarize by saying that our K-line mice, which uh, are express the active form of NHE1, show signs of cardiac hypertrophy as indicated by an increase in the cross-sectional area and interstitial fibrosis. So we went on to do some echo of our animals. And again, I tried just to break this down into sections of hypertrophy, systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, and global deterioration. We have our controls, which are our FEBs. We have our N-line, which express just the wild-type form of NHE1. And we have our K-line, which, uh, which express the active form of NHE1. So when we look at our hypertrophy, we could actually see that with the K-line, we see the greatest level of cardiac hypertrophy compared to our control. When we look at dilatation, again, we see that our K-lines show greatest levels of dilatation. When we look at systolic dysfunction in terms of fractional shortening, as well as the ejection fraction, we could see that there's a decrease, a significant decrease with our K-line mice. And again, when we look at the TIE index, which is a global deterioration of the heart, we could see that with our K-line mice, which express the active form of NHE1, there appears to be a significant increase in the TIE index. 
So basically, in summary, we could say that enhanced NHE1 expression and activity contributes to the progression of cardiac hypertrophy. And again, this is really in agreement with numerous studies which have shown that inhibition of the sodium proton exchanger actually produces protection against cardiac hypertrophy. So one of the, uh, one of the striking, in, uh, striking issues here, and I show you here a bit of a brain, and you may be asking, well, what does a brain have to do with the heart? The sodium proton exchanger, although we know it has a really important role in the heart, it was actually uh, put into clinical trials with some of the uh, inhibitors that were on the market, and this was almost 10 years ago. Now, unfortunately, some of the clinical trials didn't turn out so positive. In fact, one of them actually showed that there were cerebral uh, side effects that are, are associated with it. I was telling Professor Morrow, uh, is you know what, I guess I might be a little biased, and maybe the individuals that are writing the reviews about these clinical trials may also be a little bit biased. But it was actually stated that the clinical trials were rushed, which meant that they had put in a lot of money, but unfortunately didn't think about the, uh, the impact of rushing something like that. And uh, there was a lot of studies that showed that perhaps some of the side effects that came out were in fact a result of the, con the dosing that was used, the situation that it was used in, and the means of delivery. So regardless of what actually happened in the clinical trial, I don't think the sodium proton exchanger's implications should be undermined. However, I believe it should be noted that the sodium proton exchanger has an important physiological role and that perhaps direct inhibition of the sodium proton exchanger may not be the ideal means of targeting cardiac hypertrophy and uh, looking at ways to protect the heart. As such, I think it's really important that people need to understand how the sodium proton exchanger actually induces this cardiac hypertrophy. So in our model, we were clear that the sodium proton exchanger does cause an induction of cardiac hypertrophy, but the mechanism by which it does this, we were actually somewhat unclear about it. And as a result, we did some microarray analysis uh, with a group in California with Dr. Haddad. And what we found was that these mice showed a drastic increase in the levels of osteopointin. In fact, the level was so high that we actually uh, decided to further pursue and determine whether the sodium proton exchanger induced cardiac hypertrophy was mediated by osteopointin. So you may be asking, what is osteopointin? Osteopointin is also one of these very interesting uh, glycoproteins. It's a matricellular protein. It's actually thought to be expressed at very low levels in the heart, uh, except under conditions of uh, fibrosis, cardiac hypertrophy, where it seems to be elevated. Osteopointin is thought to be stimulated by angiotensin II. The predominant source is thought to be fibroblasts, although it has been shown in neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, as well as other cardiac cells, that there is expression of osteopointin. It was initially kind of used as an inflammatory marker and later in the last five or six years identified as an important mediator in cardiac remodeling. So the, so the osteopointin is actually thought to induce its effects by binding to integrin uh, as well as CD444+, and it's been shown in transgenic mice. Overexpression of the osteopointin results in dilated cardiac hypertrophy. There is uh, an osteopointin uh, inhibitor, although not on the market. It's uh, pretty much an individual who has uh, a compound that's being used to regress osteopointin. Now, in in vitro settings, they're using just an osteopointin uh, antibody. And quite recently, the osteopointin has been identified as a biomarker. And in fact, osteopointin has been identified as a predictor for adverse right ventricular remodeling and, dis and, and dysfunction in pulmonary hypertension. So clearly, osteopointin has an important role in uh, the cardiac remodeling process. So again, osteopointin has been shown to bind to the integrins. By binding to the integrins, it's actually thought to have an effect on the, my the myofibroblasts, on MMPs, resulting in changes in the extracellular matrix deposition and in inducing a ventricular remodeling. And so we actually wanted to determine whether the NHE1 uh, cardiomyocyte cardiac hypertrophy is induced by osteopointin because we had seen in our transgenic mice this 1,500-fold increase in osteopointin. 
And so we hypothesized that an increase in active form of NHE1 was thought to actually increase the osteopointin and contribute to cardiac hypertrophy. And again, by having this understanding, we had this idea that instead of directly inhibiting the sodium proton exchanger, we could actually inhibit the osteopointin. So we know that some of our findings are not uh, the only findings in the, ro in, the, in the world to show this association between the sodium proton exchanger and osteopointin. In fact, there was a recent study in 2013 by Vocal et al., which had shown that transgenic mice that overexpressed the serum glucocorticoid kinase 1 have an increase in both the sodium proton exchanger and osteopointin. There was no direct interaction or association between the two, but it was shown that in the presence of an NHE1 inhibitor, you were able to regress the osteopointin expression. And again, this really led us to our hypothesis is that osteopointin contributes to the cardiac hypertrophic effects of the sodium proton exchanger which in turn led us to a few objectives. Our objective was to enhance NHE1 uh, uh, in, in, in vitro at this time and silence the osteopointin of the NHE1-induced hypertrophic response in cardiomyocytes. So today I will be presenting to you our in vitro studies. So currently in Qatar, we don't have an animal facility. So unfortunately, we're relying on a cell line, probably not the most ideal cell line. But as we speak today, and as we spoke yesterday, we have transgenic mice where we've actually crossbred our NHE1 and osteopointin knockout so that we could actually further confirm some of the findings that I'm going to show you today. And again, hopefully at my next visit, I'll be able to share some of that with you. So just going back to some of our objectives, we've actually uh, hopefully show you how we've characterized infected and or transfected uh, H9C2 cells with siRNA osteopointin, ones which have been infected with NHE1. We've looked at protein expression and activity, and we started to characterize some of the signaling pathways, including the calcineurin and NFAT pathway, as well as the P90 ribosomal S6 kinase. So again, just kind of a brief overview of our experimental model in our in vitro setting. We've used H9C2 cardiomyocytes, which have actually been uh, um, uh, differentiated using retinoic acid. We infected them with our adenovirus, either the GFP or the NHE1 adenovirus. And then we've added the siRNA osteopointin to knock out our osteopointin. We went on to characterize our groups by looking at some of the osteopointin NHE1 activity looking at some of the protein kinase expression, as well as some parameters of cardiac hypertrophy, some basic parameters, cell surface area, protein content, as well as AMP mRNA. We also looked at the GATA4, which we all know is a transcription factor involved in cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So when we took our H9C2 cells and we infected them with the NHE1 adenovirus and looked at protein expression and mRNA expression, we do see that there is an increase in osteopointin in our H9C2 cells, which have been infected with the NHE1 adenovirus. And again, we're using the active form of the NHE1 adenovirus, which really confirmed what we were seeing in our in vivo setting. So we actually went on to see what happens when we just threw on some of the siRNA osteopointin, which knocked down the osteopointin. And as you could see, when we have our H9C2 cells, which have been infected with the NHE1 and the siRNA osteopointin, we're able to knock down the osteopointin protein expression. So we actually wanted to know, now that we know that these NHE1 infected cells express osteopointin, and when we add this siRNA osteopointin, we see a decrease in osteopointin, we really wanted to know what happens on the cellular level in terms of some of the cardiomyocyte hypertrophic parameters. And so we looked at something as simple as cell surface area. And what we found, again, is that when we have our NHE1 infected H9C2 cardiomyocytes, we see a significant increase in cell surface area. When we added the siRNA osteopointin, we see that this actually causes a decrease in some of the cell surface area. Similarly, when we looked at our protein content, we saw similar results. Again, with our NHE1 infected H9C2 cardiomyocytes, we see an increase in protein content, as we do with the AMP mRNA, which we know is a fetal uh, induction gene. 
Now, in the presence of the siRNA osteopointin, we see a significant decrease in protein content as well as the AMP mRNA. And again, we believe that this suggests that perhaps the osteopointin may have a role in the NHE1-induced cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. We also went on to look at the phosphogata 4 which was normalized or GATA4 total expression, to look at how this would affect uh, the GATA4 expression in the presence of the siRNA osteopointin. Again, when we have our NHE1 infected group, we do see a significant increase, one which is regressed in the presence of the siRNA osteopointin. What was really interesting is if we believe that the NHE1-induced uh, hypertrophy is uh, upstream of the osteopointin, we wanted to see what really happens with the NHE1 activity. So at first, we weren't really expecting to see much of a change in terms of the NHE1 activity. But what was really surprising is that when we infected our H9C2 cardiomyocytes, we saw an increase in NHE1 activity with our NHE1 group, which is what we expected. However, in the presence of the siRNA osteopointin, we saw a regression. And we were really surprised because we thought that the osteopointin was downstream. And what we really think is, is happening is that if there's an increase in NHE1 activity during the setting of cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, and with this siRNA osteopointin, we're regressing this, we're assuming that we're also going to be regressing the activity, and there must be some sort of positive feedback loop that is occurring between the two proteins. Sodium proton exchanger activity, one of the ways that we actually measure this is just using BCCFAM, which is just a fluorescent dye, which measures for proton exchange. And what we do is we stimulate the cells with an acid load using ammonium chloride, which allows us to measure the changes in intercellular pH. So basically, in summary, what we believe is happening, at least in an in vitro setting, and definitely needs to be confirmed more in vivo, is that this increase in the sodium proton exchanger is causing an increase in the osteopointin and contributing to this cardiac or cardiomyocyte hypertrophic effects that we're seeing. So again, we're hoping that uh, by, uh, and by inhibiting this osteopointin, we're able to regress some of these uh, parameters of cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So we actually started to investigate some of the signaling pathways that are going on. I'm just going to show you some snapshots of some of the data that we have. The one that we actually looked at is P90 ribosomal S6 kinase. And the reason we looked at P90 ribosomal S6 kinase kind of uh, is a result that risk is thought to regulate the NHE1 activity. Again, if you go back to that diagram that I showed you about the NHE1 topology, on the C-terminal tail, it showed you that it had a number of phosphorylation sites. One of the phosphorylation sites is actually thought to be directed to the P90 ribosomal S6 kinase, which I abbreviate as RISC. In addition, it's been shown that transgenic mice, which have a dominant negative risk, are actually thought to protect the heart. And so as a result, we actually tried to further elucidate whether the risk was involved in this NHE1-induced hypertrophic response. Now you, may be see, you may see here that we actually don't see, uh, you don't see my NHE1 adenoviruses. In fact, when we actually try to induce this uh, kinase activity with our adenovirus, which often requires a 24-hour period for NHE1 to be expressed, we actually didn't see any changes. So I didn't include that data in this presentation. What we ended up doing is actually using phenylephrine. Now, phenylephrine is also thought to stimulate the sodium proton exchanger, both activity as well as protein expression. It's been cited in the literature as an activator of the sodium proton exchanger since the 1990s and, in fact, was the first known activator of the sodium proton exchanger. So, again, we know that the phenylephrine is thought to act as a G protein coupled receptor, causing activation of numerous kinases, which in turn would phosphorylate the C terminal of the sodium proton exchanger and contribute to its activity. And so, what we actually did with the phenylephrine is we did a time dependent kinase assay using uh, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 60 minutes. And what we found is that with phenylephrine 30 minutes, st stimulation of phenylephrine for 30 minutes caused an increase in osteopointin expression. Interestingly, when we added a P90 ribosomal S6 kinase inhibitor, which is abbreviated as BID1, D1870, we were able to reduce this osteopointin expression. And this is actually uh, an indicator to us that perhaps P90 ribosomal S6 kinase is regressed. And I didn't actually show you some of our results, but it's actually just recently been submitted to PLUS1, is that when we actually add the dominant negative risk to NHE1-infected cardiomyocytes, we do see that it's able to regress the hypertrophic uh, response as well. 
and again, implicating that P9D ribosomal S6 kinase may be involved in the NHE1-induced osteopointin cardiac signaling pathway. Sorry, it was just a summary diagram. So we also looked at the calcineurin and fat pathway. We all know that this has numerous important uh, roles in terms of uh, inducing cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. I'm sure calcineurin and fat is not a new hypertrophic pathway to any of us. It's one that's regulated and induced by cytoplasmic calcium levels, causing the induction of N fat to the nucleus, N fat uh, interacting with GATA4 and resulting in hypertrophic gene expression. And so what we did actually with uh, our, our uh, H9C2 cells, which have been infected with the NHE1, we added FK506, which we all know is a very commonly used inhibitor of the calcineurin and fat pathway. Now, interestingly, in the presence of FK506 with the NHE1 infected group, we see that there is a reduction in the uh, osteopointin uh, expression. And again, we're just kind of following this up. We're in the process of putting something together. We know that for sure NHE1 interacts with calcineurin and fat. We know that inhibition of NHE1 prevents the N fat translocation. So the association there is definitely uh, uh, quite clear. So basically, in conclusion, we could see that the osteopointin uh, may perhaps regulate NHE1 protein expression and activity. This effect may in part may be regulated by the P90 ribosomal S6 kinase, or it could actually be uh, regulated by the calcineurin and fat pathway. So I guess we always ask ourselves, why are we doing this? What's the clinical significance? And uh, we hope that some of our findings will be uh, basically the importance of osteopointin in NHE1-induced cardiac hypertrophy. And I actually just pull out this paper as I feel it's really important to emphasize that not only is osteopointin used as a marker, a biomarker, but we know that the sodium proton exchanger has been demonstrated in human left ventricle to be upregulated in addition to in vivo and in vitro, really emphasizing the importance of NHE1 and hypertrophy. In addition, we hope that our results could be uh, uh, further indicators that osteopointin could be a marker as well as a target during cardiac hypertrophy. And again, we're hoping that this could be used in opposition to using direct inhibition of, 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 uh, of NHE1. So just here are some of our references. And again, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, uh, of course, ICGB for giving me the opportunity to share my data with you. College of Pharmacy, Cutter University, who's been very supportive of, uh, of uh, you know, allowing us to carry out some of our research and building our lab. I received my first grant uh, in 2012 from Qatar National Research Foundation. Uh, this is basically one of the, the main funding agencies in Qatar under the uh, National Priority uh, Research uh, Project Grant. My lab team, I'm sure, who are working right now while I'm here, uh, and a lot of the work was carried out by my master student, Iman Abdelaziz, and uh, uh, of course, some of the other lab members, Hamid Mlih, uh, May Yusuf, Sumaya Bushusha. So we have a diverse group in the lab from Egypt, from Lebanon, from Pakistan, from uh, France, from Tunisia. So uh, we are a multi diverse lab, and of course, some of my collaborators. Uh, from the University of Alberta, Larry Fligo and Gary Lopaschuk, as well as uh, University of Ottawa, Balwant Tawana, and uh, where transgenic mice are currently being held is University of Bordeaux in Pisic, uh, France, with uh, Alan Gadot. So uh, I'm open to any questions, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention.